All right, we are now live for session seven of Understanding Anger 2.0. So while people are gathering and uh, streaming in, I'll just give you a little summary of what this uh, series is. Some people might want to call it a class, but it's more of a monthly series of me giving some information and everybody else getting to use the chat function to chime in, ask questions, raise issues, all of that. And of course, you know, the, as the title indicates, understanding anger is the goal of this. And we did this as a series face to face at, you know, years and years ago, I want to say 2014 or no, 2015 at the Kingston Public Library in New York in the Hudson Valley. And I, you know, I started teaching a class last uh, academic year specifically focused on anger at Marquette University. And so a lot of people were like, hey, maybe you should restart that series. And I gave it some thought and I said, yeah, okay, we could do this online, reach a much wider audience. And I could do as many of these as I would like to, or as many as the audience would potentially be interested in. So we kicked it off earlier this year, and we'll be continuing on with uh, future years. And we're doing ancient philosophy and literature this year. We'll probably stick to that for next year, although we may go a little bit further along in, in the history. Maybe we'll get into some early medieval, we'll see. And so this session is devoted to Aristotle, who is really one of the first Western thinkers to systematically think about and analyze the emotion of anger. Last session, we looked at a very important work of Aristotle's with respect to the emotions, uh, the art of rhetoric. Book two is devoted entirely to discussion of the emotions and how they play out and why because it's very important for somebody who wants to be persuasive to understand how the emotions work how to provoke them how to lessen them so that was all drawing from the rhetoric today we're going to be looking at some other texts uh, primarily the nicomachean and eudamian ethics a bit of the politics we might uh, touch on some other ones as well, but you know, we can only pack in so much. So um, let's jump right in. Um, you know, Aristotle is very interested in anger. He talks about it in a lot of different texts, uh, ranging from the two ethics to on the soul or the day anima, the politics, the parts of animals even uh, seemingly logical works like On Sophistic Refutations and the Topics. Just to give you an example, in On Sophistical Refutations, he talks about the technique of getting your uh, interlocutor angry so they'll make dumb mistakes, you know. Um, now, that's not, you could say, a systematic treatment. It's just a one-off sort of thing. And Aristotle doesn't write one single systematic treatise on anger, as some later authors will do. We do know, interestingly, that there was an Aristotelian uh, somewhere down the line whose name was Jerome or Hero Hieronymus, and he wrote a text on anger from an Aristotelian perspective. It's unfortunately lost as so many ancient texts are to antiquity. But then we see people like Seneca or Plutarch, you know, writing treatises on anger later on from, you know, Stoic or, or Platonist perspectives, and they engage Aristotle very, very heavily. So there, you know, it's clear that there was an Aristotelian approach to anger. And so what we have to do is kind of piece it together from the various works. And I want to begin with a passage from the De Anima, or On the Soul. So Aristotle is using this as an example, talking about how we take multiple perspectives on different phenomena in you know, moral life or psychology or wh whatever we want to call it. And he talks about anger. And how, how would we understand anger? How, what sort of perspective do we approach it from? And he says, well, we're going to understand it differently depending on 
what we are doing, what discipline we're working in. So he uses just two examples there. A physicist, somebody who's interested in bodies, who might be interested in medicine or things like that, will think about anger in those physical bodily terms as, now here was the sort of popular view at the time, as a boiling of blood around the heart, right? Anger was associated with certain organs, the heart, uh, was the, the thing that you know, some people thought did the thinking and feeling. Um, the liver with, that generates uh, bile was also important for it. And that's one perspective, right? We can think about anger in physiological terms. And there are people who do that today. And then he talks about a dialectical philosopher, ho dialecticos, right? Which would mean somebody who is interested not so much in the body, but in thought and in emotions or in our, our reasoning processes, they're going to view anger as a desire to make another person suffer in return. Now, are these incompatible with each other? No, they're two different ways of looking at the same overarching phenomenon. And in my own research on Aristotle on anger, which goes back all the way to graduate school, so we're talking about two decades, I've actually come to the pre preliminary conclusion that there are at least six different ways in which Aristotle is looking at anger in his various works. So one of these is um, what I call the psychic or somatic, physical or somatic, right? Anger as a matter of the study of physics, the, the you know, changing environment of physical bodies. Um, it includes biology. And so we get a lot of discussion in various works in terms of motion, the heart, the blood, warmth, all that kind of stuff. And that's his, you know, it's interesting from a historical perspective. It doesn't map on to our conception of the body at present or what we know about animals as well at the, at the present time. So I, I don't really do too much with that. There are other people who are quite interested in like the parts of animals and the history of animals and things like that. Then we get what we've already discussed, the emotional or psychological, right? What we get from the rhetoric and a few other places as well. Anger is one of the basic human emotions, and we want to know how it works, what provokes anger, what lessens it, how to distinguish anger from other emotions like, say, hatred or righteous indignation. And we talked about that last time. So we're going to put those two aside. We're more interested in these four other dimensions. One of them is what I call ethical or proiretic. So proiresis is Aristotle's term for our faculty that does the choosing and where our character winds up being based. So, you know, whether we're virtuous or vicious with respect to anger, and we're going to talk a lot about that today, um, you know, we want to think about how our emotional uh, responses and actions coming from how our choices, our motivations, how these fit together, how we can evaluate them as good or bad. Um, so that's a very important dimension that we're going to look at shortly. And then there's another I call volitional or practically rational. How does anger, feeling anger, being motivated by anger, how does it affect choice or reasoning or deliberation or the intellectual virtue of prudence or the phenomenon that we're going to discuss uh, later on in this of what we call acrosia. That's a Greek word. And we translate it sometimes at, if, in a very old fashioned way as incontinence or weakness of will. But a better translation is really lack or loss of self-control. How does anger figure into that? So that's a, a fourth dimension. Then we can talk about, you know, political or legal aspects. That's another dimension. Um, how does anger figure into uh, political events or conflicts? Um, how does it affect legislation? Um, what sort of legal responsibility for doing wrong does anger 
you know, provide or excuse. These are all questions that figure in. And, and you know, Aristotle discusses these to some degree in the rhetoric and the, the two ethics, but especially in the politics. So that's a work we're going to look at today. And then the final dimension, the sixth one, is what I call the response of a theoretic. And this is from Tharain or Tharaloi, which means, uh, you know, to feel confident, to feel uh, able to do things. Anger is a very active emotion. And, you know, Aristotle says that one pseudo form of courage is actually thumos or getting angry. It's, it's a response we have to perceived threats. Um, so it has to do with confidence and fear. And it also has to do with temperament. We're going to see that Aristotle endorses in the politics a kind of Goldilocks thing with respect to the Greeks. They have the right amount of thumos, not like those lackadaisical Egyptians and Phoenicians that are kind of lacking in it, or those, you know, crazy northern people who have too much of it. You know, the Greeks are just right. So we're going to talk about that in a bit. Now, all of these, I think, provide us with some intelligibility, a capacity to understand, um, you know, human action and emotion and characters and decisions, even legal or political matters. And they all kind of interpenetrate each other. So it's not, it's, they're not like sealed off boxes where we go from, oh, we're, you know, we're no longer here in the psychological, we're now here in the ethical, and they don't have anything to do with each other. They actually have a lot to do with each other at least in Aristotle's point of view. And so we're going to be looking at these four uh, main dimensions, some a bit more than others. And I also do want to point something out before we jump right in. Um, you know, we've talked in previous sessions about the Greek vocabulary for anger. Aristotle typically is using two main words. One is orge, which we've encountered already with, you know, Plato. And uh, to, to some extent with Hesiod and Homer. Another is thumos, which is also very important. You remember in Plato, thumos was the part of your soul that gets angry, right? For Aristotle, it's not quite like that. He doesn't have the same psychology that, that Plato does. And Aristotle often uses these uh, synonymously. So um, you know, in the rhetoric, he, there's this phrase, dia thumon de kai orge ta timoretica, right? Thumos and orge are being used just as, as, as if they're the same thing. Um, you know, in the Eudamian ethics, he says that courage is di orgen kai thumon. Courage, courage can sometimes arise through anger and uh, irascibility or whatever we want to call thumos, right? And then there's other um, words that get used. There's verbs, orgizane from orge, uh, thumadzane, uh, anagnaktain is a common one, halepain, which means to be, you know, irritable, to be uh, a pain in, in the butt, uh, paroxunasai, so the parox, you know, is, is the sort of sharpness that comes with it. There's a bunch of adjectives as well. And then there's also a vocabulary of anger's opposite, of calmness. Praus is the, the word that we use for the gentle or mild or, you know, um, right-tempered person. Prautes is the, the uh, noun that we use for the virtue, as well as the lack of, of anger. Sungnome, sungnomikos, these are words for forgiveness or letting something go. Aristotle actually uses a term that we see in uh, the Gospels, um, where forgiveness is usually framed in terms of afienai, literally to let something fly, to let something go. Aristotle actually uses that in rhetoric book, book one as well. So there's an interesting vocabulary there that we can go into if people are interested in that. Uh, but let's talk about the ethics now. So this, this dimension of the ethical or the proiretic, how we, how we are as people morally, there's this really famous Nicomachean ethics passage that I think everybody is familiar with. And interestingly enough, is the very first passage in Daniel Goleman's, uh, you know, classic book, Emotional Intelligence. And it's, it's in Nicomachean Ethics uh, early on. Anybody can become angry. 
But to be angry at the right time and for the right purpose is not within everybody's power. We can all get angry. We all have the capacity for it. But getting things right is a lot tougher. Um, so, you know, if you know Aristotle and you know his ethics, you know that the middle position or the mean is quite important. So the right amount, getting angry to the right degree, right? But there's a whole bunch of other rights or uh, he calls them difficulties at one point, you know, um, how you're angry, topos in, in Greek, you know, the way in which you express your anger, the people with whom you are angry, on what grounds, epipoios in, in Greek, how long, right? Do you get angry and it goes away right away? Or you, you say a few things and now you're not angry? Or do you hold a grudge forever? Um, up to one point, one is right or makes a mistake in being angry is something that he talks about. And he says that we can go wrong in a whole bunch of different ways. We can get wrong. We can get angry with the wrong people. This is a very common uh, experience. You've all been on the end of somebody else venting or attacking uh, somebody because they're ticked off. But you're not the person who ticked them off, right? You're the wrong person. Uh, or you've done this yourself, right? <laughs> you, your boss yells at you, you come home and you, you yell at somebody else or you get on the internet and, and you know, uh, act out of anger. Um, getting angry for the wrong reasons, this happens quite frequently. More than you should, malon a day. Also more quickly, how, how much does it take to get you mad at, at people, right? This is a, a key thing. Or for a longer time, and so, you know, for Aristotle, all of these factor into what he calls the mean or the middle position. And we should remind ourselves of one uh, other thing as well. Um, Aristotle says that to have a virtue, a, a good state of character, is not just to act in accordance with reason, logos, and prudence, phronesis, but to act as the virtuous person does. So there's kind of an aspect of modeling. This could be intergenerational or cultural, right? And that, that can be very powerful for good. Uh, that can also be a problem, right? If we have the wrong kinds of models, we might get things wrong without even realizing it. In the Nicomachean Ethics, um, Aristotle suggests that there's not too many people who don't get angry as they ought to, that the vices are on really the side of excess. In the Eudamian ethics, it's a little bit more balanced. And I, I think myself that this is probably a reflection of Aristotle writing for not the entirety of Greek culture or even Athenian culture, but primarily for uh, well-to-do, you know, um, able to participate in politics because they're citizen men who, you know, um, have a lot, lot more power than everybody else in society. So they don't have to stuff their anger down quite as often. And they might actually be expected to, like, act on anger because that's viewed as being manly. But I think we can extend this to just about everybody uh, in his own time and in the present. So... Um, the vocabulary that's important here, we already brought up a little bit of it. The virtue is what he calls praotes. And this is a term that gets used um, quite a lot in ancient Greek, uh, uh, going on through the centuries after Aristotle. The virtuous person is called praos, which we translate as mild or gentle or of good temper. Interestingly, in some other literature, praos is translated as meek. And I'll just give you one example of that. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew texts of the Old Testament, uh, and, and the other texts that are written in Greek, like the Wisdom of Solomon and Ben Sirach and stuff like that, um, Moses is called praus. Moses is called meek. Now, if you know anything about the, the guy Moses, as he's depicted in the stories, he, he kills an Egyptian. He gets angry, you know. Uh, he he uh, breaks the tablets when he sees the people screwing up. He's not a guy who doesn't ever get angry. 
what he's considered to be prowess. He's considered to, they're not using an Aristotelian conception, but this is a broader cultural idea. So uh, let's talk about um, going wrong with anger. And then maybe we'll do a little bit of Q&A, take a little pause and, and uh, we'll come back to this. So excess, right? You, you know, if you've got a mean that's a middle position, you got the too much, you got the too little over here. Aristotle actually distinguishes not just one vice of excess, but he talks about five of them. Four of them in the Nicomachean Ethics, and then the Eudamian Ethics adds one more to this. Now, is this an entire typology of ways people get anger wrong? No, I, we could have others besides this as well. So there's the quick temper, or the hotheads, we might translate them, the orgiloi in Greek. They get angrier quicker than they ought to with the wrong people, over the wrong things. But there's one nice thing about them. Their anger is quickly dissipated. So they get angry quickly, but they also get non-angry or calm quickly as well. Um, it's still a problem, right? They're getting things wrong characteristically. They fly off the handle, as we say. Uh, you know, it's a common expression. In the uh, Eudamian ethics and in the rhetoric, Aristotle uses a different term, oxuthumos, and this means like sharp-tempered, right? Think of them as like always ready to go off. And I've known people like this. I actually kind of envy them as somebody who's had to struggle with anger because they are vicious, but it's not as bad as some of the other vices. So a vice that's worse is the rageful, the acroholoi. So holos is bile the bile that's produced by your liver. This is a, a term that gets used in ancient literature uh, going way before Aristotle, like in Homer for, for anger, right? And um, they get angry quickly, but they get angry over everything. And they're not like the short fuse people, the hotheads in that they don't, they don't cease being angry uh, right away, right? So they, they tend to get angry in all sorts of situations. These are the people that um, we say, you've got an anger problem, right? Then there's a, a third one. And um, the word picroi that Aristotle uses to describe them literally means bitter, right? The taste of bitterness as opposed to sweetness, glucose, right? Um, or other tastes. And uh, interestingly, the Greeks arranged um, the, the eight tastes or the nine or seven different flavor profiles. They didn't have four, as we often talk about in the present. Um, they arranged them with sweet on one end, and then like fatty came close to that, and then bitter on the other end. And so bitterness is something bad, right? And Aristotle um, says that these are people who remain angry for a long time. They keep their anger in. They hold on to it. They guard it, right? And they remain resentful. Um, they're motivated by vengeance. And these people are discussed in the Nicomachean Ethics and the Rhetoric and in the Eudamian Ethics. In the Eudamian Ethics, they literally guard their anger. They, they maintain a watch on it. And so these are people that are pretty hard to get out of the state of anger. And then we have another one, uh, which is kind of curious. They're the, the halepo. You remember I, I used the term halepain, right? So the halepoi are, we translate them as harsh-tempered or troublesome. I actually like the translation pains in the asses, you know, the kind of people that are always kind of, you know, sniping, passive-aggressive, irritable, you know, and they, uh, like he says, become troublesome, Hale, halepainontas in, in classic Greek. And that means to like, you know, raise, raise trouble with with other people. And they do so more than they should for a longer time. And then he says, they will not be reconciled without retribution, you know, which is what anger seeks, or punishment, colossus, you know, hurting the other person. Um, in the Eudamian ethics, he calls these the thumo, thumo odes. And then in the Eudamian ethics, we have one other class. And this is less to do about how intense the anger is or how long you hold on to it. It has to do more with behavior. 
like the people who get really out of control, um, they are the violent, the plague taste, the people who hit other people, literally, or the abusive, the uh, loidoreticos. That, that means people who use bad language, who call people names, who you know say things, who tear other people down. They're engaging in retaliation, which is what anger is, is looking for, right? And um, this, uh, Aristotle thinks, it can be understood as a separate vice. You know, it's not just that they feel too much anger. They're too easy in using force or um, insult against other people. So those are the, the five vices, specific vices, with respect to anger. But we could have others as, as well. Then we've got, you know, on the other side, vices of defect, not getting angry when you should get angry, when it's appropriate. And he calls them a couple different words. He calls them inerascible or spiritless, on urge ton, right? So on is, is without, and then the urge is, is anger, right? So these are the people who don't get angry. Or even slavish, uh, andropopo, uh, andropododes in, in uh, Aristotle's Greek. So these are the people who are willing to put up with things that they shouldn't, he says. They don't get angry at things that they ought to get angry or in situations where they ought to. Um, they're considered foolish. They don't get angry with the right people at the right time in the right way. Um, so who should you get angry with, we could ask, right? If uh, So one of the examples that I use quite frequently in discussing this is when you have somebody who you are responsible for and you see them getting bullied, well, you, from an Aristotelian perspective, you should get angry. Not like, you know, get angry and pick up a hammer and start beating people on the head, but you should get angry enough to motivate you to do the right thing, which is to stand up for the people who are, you know, perhaps your your spouse, your children, your parents. These are people Aristotle talks about in, in the rhetoric. And they will, uh, these people who are vicious by not getting angry, they accept insults and humiliating treatment. They don't stand up for themselves or their friends. Um, in the Eudamian ethics, he says they feel pain slowly or less intensely or for a short time. And Aristotle says sometimes this gets praised as mildness, as the virtue, but it's not really. It's it's vicious. So that's a lot of me talking already. We're about half an hour into this. Any questions, comments people want to raise before we start talking about the virtue of uh, good temper and um, how we can figure out how to how to deal how to do this? You know, take a little drink. Meanwhile, I'll also say hi to uh, the people that are saying hello, uh, Mark and the White Tower. Um, Mark is a longtime interlocutor. The White Tower is a, a newer one. Um, if there aren't any questions, I'll, I'll move on and talk about um, the virtue with respect to anger. I'll give it just a, another few seconds. All right. Well, let's let's launch into it then. So, what is the virtue like? You know, again, we mentioned for Aristotle. Oh, here we go. Uh, well, the, the Selens will will address later on because that's more of a political question. Um, and the White Tower says, "How could you best stand up for your friends, especially if you're bullied at school?" Well, this is the lead into the virtue then. Let so um, we should talk about what Aristotle thinks right anger looks like. So Aristotle says um, there aren't any universal rules for this, right? We have to be attentive to the what he calls the particulars or the context. He says that uh, judgment, uh, crisis, occurs through perception of you know what's what's in the situation, and you know one way of looking at this is these rights. How do we apply these? The right this, the right that, that gets us to the mean. So right person, who should we be angry with? So, you know, just to take um, uh, the White Towers question, standing up for your friends, being bullied at school, um, the right person to direct your anger at is the bully or 
the school officials who are not doing something about it. You can go into the principal's office and be ticked off and be like, you're not doing something about bullying, right? Um, taking it out on random people, wrong person, right? So we want to be directing our anger at the people who are responsible for the situation. Right grounds or reason. Um, it's very important that the for, for the virtuous anger that you're getting angry over the right things and for the right reason. Um, not because, you know, so again, bullying. Um, if you want to think about your, your dependent being bullied, um, you could have a wrong reason for getting angry. You could be like, I can't believe they did that to me. They didn't do it to you. They did it to your kid, right? And you should be concerned about your kid as a person who matters, not just as an extension of yourself, right? So the right reason, uh, the right manner or way, this has to do more with how we express our anger, how we act on it. Um, again, if, if we use the example of bullying, you see somebody getting bullied, you, you get angry, what do you do? You could say, hey, knock that off, or hey, don't be a bully, right? Now, you could also go and pick up a, a two by four and start beating the crap out of them. That would be excessive, right? Um, now, if, if the bullies start attacking you, maybe then it's time to pick up a two by four and start hitting them. But you know, there's a lot of ways in which when we get angry, uh, we don't have to go quite so far at the very start. Uh, the right intensity of emotion. How angry do we get? There is some things for which it's, you know, it's more appropriate for us to get mildly annoyed. There's other things where it does make sense for us to get really angry, right? And then everything in between. Um, there's some people who just get really angry over every single thing, like the rageful who we talked about earlier, right? That is a vicious disposition. Um, the You could say there's a proportionality to um, your, your anger. If you're virtuous, you get angry to the right amount. Um, right quickness, how quickly do you get angry? Do you get angry over, let's say you're driving, and, you know, traffic is slow. Do you get angry right away? Does it take you quite a long time before it bothers you? Do you maybe you don't get bothered at all because you're like, well, nothing to, nothing I can do about traffic, right? So the, the rapidity with which you get angry, how long you stay angry. You know, the virtuous person is not going to hold on to their anger forever because that's not good. It'll actually congeal into something more like hatred after a while. Um, how you retaliate or how you act, are you acting rightly or are you making an error or, or sin? And then, you know, another possibility for the virtue um, that Aristotle actually talks about, that it sounds less like a, a, the right amount of emotion and more like the stoic approach that, that Seneca will lay out later on, is to be untroubled or calm, um, atarachos, not driven by the emotion, but as reason ordains, right? A Seneca will observe later on, we're going to talk about this, uh, I think in December, that uh, anything that you can do with the emotion of anger, you can also do with right practical reason. And Aristotle brings it to a close by saying the virtuous person is not really disposed to punish but to forgive. So they're not going to get angry in every single situation. They'll get angry when it's appropriate, to the right amount, with the right people, you know, all, all of these sorts of, of things. And um, one of the things that we can think about, I think this is quite helpful, how do we actually get there, right? So we generally, for virtues, for Aristotle, we have a pro we don't we don't automatically have the virtue. We get there by a process of moving uh, through being self-controlled, through doing things that we recognize as right, but we don't really want to, you know, like, like we restrain our anger to actually being virtuous. And you know, anger he thinks serves an important role. It provides energy or motivation that can be integrated. And this is the key thing: integrated. Not anger's not running the show. It's it's a tool. And anger can also serve another helpful role. Um, sometimes being angry 
will help us attend to things that we were missing before, to particulars, to modalities of moral values, to what Nancy Sherman calls ethical salience, you know, what is relevant in the situation. Um, and so, you know, how do we form ourselves as people? This is something that is a bit underemphasized in Aristotle's account. Um, the laws, you know, it's common in ancient philosophy to talk about the laws uh, helping us out. I don't think our laws really do at all. Um, they don't make us virtuous. They're sort of like guardrails. You can go this far, but not any further. Um, praise and blame. This is very important for Aristotle. Um, you know, we learn early on if we have good guardians or good advisors, we get praised for doing the right thing. We get, we get criticized or blamed for doing the wrong thing. We can also say that um, culture plays a role, examples, what Aristotle calls mimesis, um, which is uh, imitation, which includes all of our cultural products. You know, when we see something on TV and we then follow that example, uh, that is, is mimesis. And he talks about that quite a bit in, in the poetics and the politics. Um, education and discipline. Um, we don't get an awful lot of this when it comes to anger. In our contemporary societies, we don't get much explicit discussion of how the emotions work uh, unless you screw up and then they send you to anger management and then you start to learn about this sort of thing. Um, you know, we could also talk about um, what we're doing right here, explicit reasoning about anger, how it does things, you know, having dialogues, uh, doing, doing some counseling or philosophy. And Aristotle, <clears throat> unfortunately, doesn't give us exercises for dealing with anger like um, later philosophers will, like Seneca, again, for example, or Plutarch. But it doesn't mean that we couldn't actually derive these ourselves. And I think that there's uh, that's a kind of a good project for people to work on. You know, figuring out what the mean is, asking all these questions. When, I, when I'm in a situation and I'm starting to get ticked off and I'm ready to like blow up at this person, is this the right person? Or am I going the wrong way with my anger? I'm tempted to like, I'm so angry I want to punch somebody or say something, you know, start swearing at people. Is that the right way of expressing my anger? Um, we can also look at, as we're going to talk about, our perceptions and judgments and reasoning processes, because those play a role. Anger is not just a knee-jerk response. Aristotle thinks, as does Plato, as do the Stoics, that emotions have both an affective side, a feeling side, but they're also cognitive. They are the result of making judgments, of engaging in you know, reasoning processes, thought processes, as, as we call them. And you can look at that and you can examine your thought processes and figure out where you're going wrong and how to fix that. So um, let's talk uh, about the next dimension, the volitional or practically rational dimension. And this is where we bring up this term that I, I mentioned at the start of this, acrasia, which, you know, it gets translated in older translations as incontinence, uh, kind of a, has the wrong connotations these days. Um, weakness of will. Aristotle doesn't actually have a conception of will as such, so that's not that great of a translation. Or lack or loss of self-control. I think that's a better translation. And this is a really major contribution that Aristotle makes to moral theory, making sense of a experience that we clearly have, you know, um, when we know what the right thing is and we do the opposite, or we know something is wrong and that we shouldn't do it, and yet we do do it, right? There's knowledge and there's the failure to follow through on that knowledge. And uh, Richard Robinson has a really great quip about this in his article, Aristotle on Acrasia. He says, he did, evidently, he did not write nearly a whole book on Acrasia to deny that it ever occurs. There are some philosophers, you know, certain interpretations of Socrates, um, the Stoics sometimes, although they're a bit of two minds about this, where they say, there's no such thing as Acrasia. Aristotle says, yeah, there is, and I'm going to tell you about it. So, you know, um, 
Aristotle is going to give us kind of a fragmentary outline and sketch of this. And uh, interestingly, we tend to be rather, you know, ecratic or we don't have automatic self-control. It's something we have to develop over time. Uh, Miles Burniett, the great uh, a classic scholar, said, the seeds of acrasia are going to be with us as soon as we enter Aristotle's lecture room. We, we are trying to develop, right? And so acrasia occurs, according to Aristotle, because we have a conflict within us between something higher and something lower. And what, what the higher and the lower is varies considerably. It could be, you know, right principle, it could be, um, you know, phronesis, it could be, um, you know, boulesis, which is uh, sort of a, a, the, the rational appetite. And then what we're uh, failing in respect to, it could be desire, it could be the emotions, it could be all sorts of things, right? Um, could be uh, desire for, for physical pleasure uh, or to avoid pain. But what happens is we've got a kind of uh, disharmony within the soul. And then we follow the dictates of, of the lower part. And Aristotle tells us that there's different kinds of acrasia. There's like acrasia per se, which we're not going to talk about here. That has, has more to do with pleasure, right, and pain. And then there's, we can be acratic with respect to all sorts of other things. So some of these are goods like parents and children. You know, people will do the wrong thing because they they want to maintain that relationship. They want to help out their kids. They want to help out their their family, right? Wealth. People do all sorts of things that they shouldn't, um, that they know they shouldn't because they want to make money or hold on to money. But it can also occur with respect to anger. We lose our self-control and we say things, do things that we know we shouldn't. And yet we find ourselves doing them, right? I think it's a very common experience, isn't it? And so he says that um, we can distinguish it as a, a, a crassia catameros, a qualified form of acrasia, uh, in relation to the pleasures and pains that are provoking or involved in the emotion of anger, um, the desire that anger involves. Um, you know, these are things that we see in the rhetoric discussion, right? And so what is what is the pain that's there? Pain in the perception or imagination of being wrongly slighted, being treated in a way that you think is, is wrong. And then there's a pleasure in imagining or carrying out retribution. You can be like, oh, I can't wait to get that son of a bitch, you know? And then the desire for apparent retribution, desire to make the other person suffer in return. And interestingly, Aristotle is not just going to say, yeah, this is, this is what happens. We, we lose our, our self-control and it's because of these factors. Aristotle actually thinks that losing your control due to anger is morally better or at least less shameful than losing control in general. And why? So here's where we learn something really important about anger. Um, Anger, as he says, is like a hasty servant that listens to some of the instructions and then goes, rushes off and does what it thinks it's supposed to do without actually paying close attention. And he says, anger syllogizes, it reasons. Uh, Syllogodzein is, is the word that's being used there. Now, don't think about syllogisms, you know, with like two premises and a conclusion. It's not quite that um, uh, rigid. Um, but anger does engage in reasoning processes, but it gets them kind of wrong. It doesn't pay attention to all of the factors. Um, he says that the ecratic person is controlled by their thumos, but also to some degree by reason. But the reasoning process there is distorted. It's, it's a bit screwed up. And then that's one interesting thing. So he says, you know, it's more rational. So that's, that's, that's great. Um, then he gives three additional reasons for why acrasia due to anger is morally better than um, acrasia due to desires for bodily pleasures. And he says, it's more excusable or forgivable to follow a natural desire, orexes, and um, thumos is more natural than epithumiae. Um, so, you know, epithumiae are the desires for physical pleasures. 
uh, thumos, he thinks, is more at the core of our humanity than just being driven by desire to eat, have sex, lay in the sun, stuff like that. He also says uh, something that you might agree with. Uh, Seneca actually writes about this specifically in his On Anger later on. Anger is more open. It's more publicly apparent, phaneros, above the board, right? It's less given to plotting, doing things secretly. When you get angry, you're, you're letting people know, right? Um, the desires for pleasure are more secretive. And so anger, he says, is less unjust than, you know, these sneaky people that are trying to get pleasure. And then in the rhetoric, he provides another uh, line of reasoning. He says that retribution against enemies is more just than reconciling with them because retaliation is just and therefore noble. I don't think we want to take this quite so far as Aristotle does. Uh, you know, there's debates about in the rhetoric, is he really like laying out his moral theories or just saying, here's some arguments that you could make. Uh, but he does, he does say that. Um, and so we can think about, you know, um, how does anger actually affect our, our judgment and our reasoning? And one way that it does it is it makes us narrow in. We get too quick in reasoning that an insult has been made. We're less likely to extend goodwill to others. And this can, as he points out, um, in the Nicomachean ethics, as well as in the politics, this can be devastating for friendships, not just within families, not just within the, the political community, but within friendships as well. If we uh, lose that, you know, goodwill to the other people, you know, yeah, um, that is really quite, uh, you know, a, an obstacle to having good friendships. Um, so, you know, we can ask, and this is where we're going to come back to the, the various rights. Um, how does the non-vicious, non acratic person, the person who has self-control, how do they sometimes go wrong with anger and how could practical reasoning fit in with this? Practical reasoning might be part of what is screwing things up for us, right? If we have the wrong sort of practical reasoning um, or it might be something that gets things right. So let's think once again about these different um, as things should be or are right. So right person or wrong person, right? We can go astray by thinking that somebody is uh, doing something to us when they're not doing something. And we can go wrong in thinking that the punishment or retribution should be applied to this person. Um, we can also be frustrated when somebody doesn't help us. We take them as being a jerk to us, right? When we, when we want help from them or they ignore us, right? Um, sometimes people get angry at other people preemptively over what they're likely to do, Aristotle says. And there's a reasoning process going on there. This person has said this thing. People who say these sorts of things are likely to treat me this way. Therefore, I don't, you know, because I don't like that, I'm going to get angry at them, even though maybe they're saying something completely different. Right grounds or wrong grounds. Uh, we infer that something constitutes slighting. It's not as if it's a natural property of actions. We have to read that in, you know. And so, you know, one uh, particular dynamic that Aristotle talked about that we mentioned last time is if somebody makes fun of something that you care about, especially if you're insecure about that matter, then you can get angry at them because you feel like you're being harmed, like the thing that you care about is being harmed harmed when really that's not the case at all. I mean, if somebody says, uh, so I like heavy metal, right? If somebody comes along and says, rat sucks, twisted sister sucks, iron maiden sucks. How the hell does that affect those bands? It doesn't do anything to them and it doesn't actually do anything to me, but we get angry about that, that sort of thing, you know, um, how angry we get. It's not just a, you know, a knee jerk reflex reaction um, the amount of anger that we have, we infer a kind of reasonable proportionality in relation to the perceived offense, right? So anger tends to blind us or make us bad judges of this sort of measure. This is why we often get angrier than we, we ought to. 
And Aristotle notes, uh, again, back in the rhetoric, that there's tendencies to get angrier with certain people, like our friends, right? We think that we should be treated better by our friends than by other people. And if they betray us, we get really, really angry. Um, how quickly do we get angry? You know, should we let some things go, not interpret them as slighting? Or should we apply a sort of being able to you know, brush things off, give people the benefit of the doubt, right? Those are matters of practical reasoning. Um, how long we should be angry. If we choose to dwell on angry thoughts, you know, reasonings or arguments or fantasies, that can keep us angrier longer than we ought to be. So, for example, one of the common anger treatments is you're angry, count to 10, right? Or go take a walk. Now, if you're counting to 10 and you're like, one, that son of a bitch made me angry. Two, I need to retaliate against him. You're, you're going to stay angry, right? That's not going to work. You need to like clear your head. If you go for a walk and you think about why you, you hate this person and the things that they do, that's not going to make you less angry, right? So that's dwelling on angry thoughts. Um, we can also ask if it's rational to hold grudges long term, you know? Um, and, and this is where anger gets really dangerous. Anger can turn into hatred, as Aristotle recognizes. It's actually one of the causes of hatred. And hatred is not curable with time the way that anger tends to be. So we want to be quite careful about that. Um, how we should act, right? There's practical reasoning involved there as well. A key line of practical reasoning that Aristotle talks about. So-and-so slighted me. That's wrong. I should seek retribution. And, you know, we could um, engage in some deliberation or some purpose of choice. We can ask ourselves, is this something good for me? Is this something good in general? Um, there's a tendency that we have to focus too much on attaining retribution, how we can get it, not enough on the other relevant factors in the situation, like you're going to damage your relationship with this person, or you're going to show yourself as being a person with anger problems. Or you're going to take unnecessary physical risks. This is something people do all the time. Or you might not even be able to get that satisfaction. You know, If you're going to try to hurt somebody and they don't take it seriously, you're still going to be pissed off with them, right? There's also a tendency on our parts to magnify the, the slighting, the thing that somebody did that we don't like, and to seek to impose a disproportionate uh, retribution on them as a result. Because we've, we've already, you know, sort of like old computer stuff, garbage in, garbage out. If we have incorrect um, uh, reasoning or premises about things, we're going to get um, incorrect outputs as well. So before we go into the political or legal dimension, uh, let's take a few of these questions. So uh, Robert says, where does comedy or wit or even the clown in the Hikoya have a place in this conversation? He doesn't have a place in this conversation. Aristotle's not mentioning them. I mean, we could read in that the person who is a buffoon, who is um, joking all the time, might tick people off because, you know, they think that things that shouldn't be joked around about or being joked around about. Or we could also get angry at the person who's what Aristotle calls a boor, who doesn't like to, to laugh with the rest of us, right? And we could, I mean, really, we could get angry at anybody who is perceived as being vicious. So, you know, for example, when we see somebody doing something cowardly. We can get angry at them for that, right? Or when we see something, somebody doing something rash, we could get angry at them for that. But we have to somehow take it personally. It's got to concern us for us to get angry over it. And so we could ask ourselves, what's our, what's our reasoning? Why, why do we care so much about, you know, what a clown does so that we can get angry at them, right? I mean, if the clown is coming up to you and like poking you in the eyes like the Three Stooges, that's a pretty straightforward thing, right? But if, you know, so think about how comedians make fun of politicians, right? There are some people with very, very thin skin. Um, you know, one of the motivators for Donald Trump to like seriously run for president 
was the fact that Barack Obama made fun of him at the press correspondence dinner a long, long time ago. And he, Trump is a grudge holder. He's, he's a perfect example of somebody who is vicious with respect to, to anger and many other things, too. He's intemperate. He's unjust, you know. Um, and then, you know, people can get angry at him quite easily. And, you know, so that that adds up. Faust, how would you feel if you didn't eat breakfast this morning? It totally depends. I mean, some bre some mornings I don't eat breakfast. Other mornings I do. Um, if I need those, you know, calories and energy and stuff like that, and I'm not getting it, we can often have what we call being hangry, right? Snickers has made an entire set of commercials about that where somebody is really mad and mean and then they get a Snickers bar and now they're back to being their normal self. And that would have to do with what we talked about as the physical somatic um, dimension of anger, which we're not really going into here. Um, any other question? Oh, let, let's let's take uh, Celine's question at this point in time. How can we stay calm while living in a developing country? Well, I mean, the first thing to do would be look at the other people who are living in a developing country who are able to stay calm, many of which you encounter, and say, how do they do it, right? It's not so much about being in a developing country because you can be here in the United States where we have incredible inequities and crazy disparities across the line, uh, not just from state to state, but even within a municipality. For example, here in Milwaukee, we have some of the poorest zip codes in the entire nation, right? Places where if you're born there and you live there and go to school there, you're probably going to have much worse outcomes than if you're in some rich suburb or something like that. You know, um, this is not a uh, just developing country issue. And, and you could say that part of it is thinking about how you develop your own self-control and, you know, overcome the resentment and rancor that's likely to arise, you know. All right. Um, Lilacal, could anger be good? Aristotle thinks anger can be good. And we just talked about this at great length. <laughs> Virtuous anger, good anger, right? Feeling angry at the right time with the right people to the right extent, that, that is not just good, that's a virtue for Aristotle. This is where Aristotle is going to differ from, say, the Stoics, you know, who think that anger is always bad. Or Cicero, Cicero also thinks that. Uh, the White Tower, social anger and outrage have been the forces within society all along. Many forms of intolerances were driven by a sense of outrage. <clears throat> anger was pretty much exploited by leaders of the time. Yeah, sure. That, that's, I mean, that's why we need to be virtuous with respect to anger. Um, Aristotle talks about this. We're going to get into this as we talk about the political dimension. Um, anger, it's not the only emotion, hatred, envy, lots of other emotions can get appealed to as well in similar ways. But anger from an Aristotelian perspective can also be good for mobilizing against injustice. You know, again, big difference between Aristotle and the Stoics on, on this particular matter. A Aristotle thinks that, and so does Plato, Anger can be a useful fuel, but you got to watch it just like you would watch a fire in your campsite so it doesn't start everything else on fire. Um, Lilacol, doesn't it contradict the fact that the mean doesn't justify the end? There is no such fact. I, I don't know where you got the idea that that's a fact that you should believe in, but it sure as hell ain't. Um, that's a saying, not a fact, and it might be right or it might be wrong. And it depends on what mean we're talking about, what end we're talking about. You can't generalize in that way, right? And the mean here that we're talking about is the middle position, not the mean that leads to an end, right? Those are two different senses of mean. So you want to be really, really careful about your vocabulary when it comes to that. So, all right. Any other questions before we go on to talking about the political dimensions, legal dimensions as well, of, of anger. I'll get a little drink. There, there's really uh, tea. Can we practice up to the point that we have no anger at all? Um, uh, I mean, theoretically, sure. 
But that would be foolish from an Aristotelian perspective, as we've already explained, because Aristotle thinks there are situations in which you need to get angry. But if you want to try to do this thing that almost no human has ever pulled off, eh, more power to you. <laughs> you know, even the Stoics get angry uh, on occasion, right? Um, all right, so let's go on and talk about the political ramifications of anger. And there's really um, three that, that are important in the politics. And, and one of these is in book five. So there's this term called stasis, and that's what book five is really about. Stasis gets translated sometimes as revolution, but that's not a good translation for it. Social discord, social breakdown is a better way of understanding it. It's when you have factions, oh, that's another way of translating it, factionalization, factions within society that are essentially fighting with each other within the society, trying to dominate, trying to push their competitors out, uh, very often saying bad things about each other. Um, and so Aristotle sees this as a big problem in Greek city-states, and it's a, it's a big problem throughout human history, whether we're in city-states or nations or pick whatever. I mean, it can happen within other organizations like a company. So um, it doesn't happen just because of like distinctively political factors or dynamics. It's also because all these things interpenetrate with each other. So one, one thing that leads to this, in Politics Book 1, Aristotle talks about how being human and having logos, which means both speech and rationality, allows us to have perception and communication and sharing in different values, like the just and the unjust, or the noble and the base, or the good and the bad, or the useful and the harmful. But we also disagree about these. And those disagreements, what actually is the right thing to do? Oh, this is the right thing. No, no, this is the right thing. These can easily generate lots of lasting conflict. We also, these disagreements tend to happen in terms of justice and equality and fairness. Um, in book five, where he's talking about stasis, Aristotle says that it takes place because of equality and inequality and disagreements about how these are understood. So, you know, rich people tend to think that they're entitled to the riches that they have and that they're better than other people. This is a common dynamic. Aristotle actually thinks you got to really rein in the rich because they tend to be, um, you know, they tend to be, as we say, uh, here in America, they get too big for their britches, right? And they they act like jerks. Um, ordinary people, the the commoners, the the many, tend to think that everybody should be on the same level. And Aristotle says they're both right and they're both wrong. They're both wrong because they take an absolute position, um, which is only qualifiably true. They all make contributions to society, but they are not the central people. Uh, so that's very common. People have differing conceptions of what's right and wrong, what's just, unjust, fair, you know, equitable. And then there's also the desires for gain or profit. People are motivated to compete or honor, and then they're opposites. Um, and it, it's not just about them. It's also about their friends and family and associates and things they identify with. And so Aristotle looks at the causes of stasis. What, what actually leads to this? So one of these is what we call outrage or insolence, hubris. Fear is another major factor. Uh, superiority or predominance, uh, huperoche in, in Greek. Um, contempt, kataphronesis. Disproportionate growth of a part of the political community. Um, intrigue, right? People doing uh, things in backroom deals. Sliding, oligoria, pettiness, microtes, you know, being being kind of a uh, skin flint or stuff like that, and then dissimilarity. Now you, you notice that when you look at these, um, the you know a, a number of these are actually the way anger works: contempt, uh, hubris. Those are two forms of oligoria, sliding, right? So anger 
plays a significant role within how stasis actually works. People get angry with each other over this, and then they're likely to retaliate against each other or to try to get each other, things like that. Um, so, you know, the passions play a, a central role in social breakdown. And, uh, you know, hatred also plays a major role as well. And what are the causes of hatred? Well, one of these is also a cause of anger, spitefulness, doing things to screw with people just to screw with them. Um, diabole, slander, you know, saying bad things about people, which we're likely to do when we're angry. And then the other cause of hatred, anger, order gay. Right. So anger, along with hatred, along with fear, along with a couple other, you know, desire and stuff like that, plays a really significant role in how things break down for uh, societies, for communities, for organizations. Uh, even fear can involve anger and hatred, because what are we afraid of in our society? Uh, Aristotle says even the signs of um, certain things are fearful things. And what are those things? Other people being angry, other people having hatred. If we, if we think that other people want to destroy us, we fear them. And then we're likely to try to destroy them, you know, or sideline them as a result. When we see people getting angry, that can be very scary too, especially when the anger is kind of out of control. When we see that it's vicious, you know, we think, oh, what if that person gets angry at me or angry at the people I care about, right? So um, these, are, these are quite important factors. So anger plays a major role, as does hatred, as does fear, in the divisions within our society that can lead to conflict, that can lead ultimately to social breakdown. Um, another really important political dimension or legal dimension, what does anger really want? It wants to punish. It wants to retaliate, to impose retribution on somebody. So, you know, when we perceive wrongdoing, um, slighting, unequal or too slow justice happening, which is often the case in our contemporary justice, um, uh, you know, situations, let's call it, right? We see people doing bad stuff and they get a little fine um, or they, nothing really happens to them. That pisses us off. That, that makes people angry. That can contribute to stasis, but that can also contribute to wanting to see somebody punished, right? And if we're vicious with respect to anger, we might be like, I don't care who gets punished. I just want to see somebody pay for this, you know? Well, that, that can be a significant problem. Aristotle will, at a couple different places in the politics and the rhetoric and the Nicomachean ethics, he makes distinctions about how we should look at people's wrong actions, how, you know, actions that are damaging to other people. And there's a continuum. There's a tuchema, which is sort of, we translate it as mischance. The person didn't know that this thing was going to happen at all. And it's just an unfortunate accident, but they're, you know, to some degree, part of the causality. So they're, they're responsible to some degree, but we, we shouldn't really get angry at them. We should actually feel pity for them more than anything else. Then we have hamartia, and this is translated quite often as error or sin or, you know, doing something wrong, but, you know, not doing something wrong because we actively chose to do it, but because, it's not just an accident now. We played a bigger role in it. And it might come from us being angry and then, you know, revealing a secret that we shouldn't have, right? Or doing something that, that we, we shouldn't. Um, and that can be forgiven, but now we should also be more careful about that. And then we have two other things. Somebody can commit uh, a wrong act, something that is actually morally wrong and uh, do so knowing that they're, they're doing it, but, you know, maybe out of acrosia, right? They get angry and they, um, they lose their temper and they swear at somebody, right? They, they maybe disparage their character or they, they lose their temper and they punch somebody, right? But that's not the way that they act all the time. They were being provoked or things were really too much for them, right? It's still a wrong action 
right? And it still has to be addressed. But it's not coming from vice. It's coming from some, some other lesser moral failure. And then we've got actions that come from vice. And this is where we can talk about the people who are vicious with respect to anger, right? Those who typically are abusive, right? Or those who hold grudges for a long time and then they finally get their revenge on somebody and it screws things up for everybody. Um, that may be an, you know, adikia, an injustice that is committed from the vice of injustice. And Aristotle actually talks about, uh, in book five of the Nicomachean Ethics, justice as complete virtue. And he uses as examples of, uh, you know, what this entails, that the laws tell us not to hit each other or to use abusive language. That's it with respect to anger, right? So, you know, thinking about the modalities of, of wrongdoing and how we should punish it and how angry we should get at these people, another important political or legal dimension. And then finally, uh, this is kind of leading us into the fourth uh, dimension. In Politics Book 7, Aristotle talks about, as I mentioned before, um, the Greeks are the best people, according to Aristotle. Everybody else are barbarians of one form or another. And uh, in order to be the best kind of people, you need to have two things going for you. You need to be intelligent, right? You have to have your dianoia, your, your intellect going full, uh, full bore. And you also need to have thumos, uh, working for you, the part of us that that gets angry or the dimension of us that gets angry, you need to be thumoides, right? Uh, of the sort of people that that are are angry like that. And um, you know, the Greeks, according to Aristotle, so we've got like a, a big picture and then a little picture. Greeks are right in the middle, and they are both intelligent and thumoides. Now, not all the Greeks, of course, because we have slaves and we have women and we have all this, this other stuff going on at the same time, right? Um, but we, we at least do have um, uh, that going for them. Now, the people to the south, <laughs> what we call geographic determinism, right? The people to the south, like Egyptians and Phoenicians, and they're, they're very interested in trade and, and motivated by their desires, but they don't have much thumos. That's why they're not very good fighters. And, um, you know, they're not, you know, they're enterprising in terms of commerce, but not in terms of noble things, right? And now, is, is this true? No, I mean, clearly not, right? If we know much about ancient history, but Aristotle's indulging himself in this thing that a lot of Greeks would do. As a matter of fact, lots of cultures do this sort of thing. To the north, we have people like the Celts, you know, the, the Germans aren't even really on the horizon for, for the ancient Greeks. They'll come in later on. The Celts are the badasses of the time, as are the Scythians. And these people have too much thumos. They love to fight all the time, right? They're not that bright, um, not like the Greeks. Um, so, you know, the Greeks are the ones right in the sweet spot, we could say. And so, you know, having the right amount of like competitiveness, anger, that's viewed as something important for societies and, and uh, peoples for, for Aristotle. Uh, he also says something really interesting about this. The capacity to command, to, to rule over, uh, over other people, and the love for freedom, he says, both of these stem from thumos. Again, that's why the Egyptians are, you know, so willing to accept the tyranny of other people. You know, they just want a nice, easy life. They're not interested in freedom or running the show, you know. And then the northerners who get a little bit too much of that thumos, well, they love freedom, you know, perhaps too much to, to where it keeps them from being able to work with each other. And they all want to be in charge, right? Whereas the Greeks, again, are in the, the nice, sweet spot. Now, of course, Aristotle says, once we get to the Greeks, like some cities are more this way, some cities are more this way, right? Uh, and is, is any of this really that plausible? I, I would say it, it's far too general, but it's an interesting point of view that he, he lays out. And I think that this idea for Aristotle, that the ability to command other people and the love of uh, eleutheria, freedom, 
both being connected closely with thumos this is very interesting and this kind of goes back to plato as well that that you know spirited part of the soul thumos plays a important role with that the, uh, I, i'll answer some questions in just a minute but i do want to say one other thing aristotle as i mentioned before um in, in the Nicomachean Ethics, in book three, he tells us that there, in addition to actual courage, there's things that look like courage but are actually not. And one of these is the thumos that we might act upon. And interestingly, the example that he gives is of wild beasts protecting their children. They're doing so from a sort of instinct and a spirited part of their soul. Even animals that we don't usually associate with anger or, or thumos like lions will do so um, when we threaten their children quite often. <clears throat> and Aristotle takes this as um, providing a certain kind of ability to, to fight back, right? So when, there, when threats are perceived, that is often when not only animals, but us, rational animals, will get angry. And, it's, and that is a uh, less you know, deliberate, thought-out response. It's more instinctual. Um, and so that's, that's an important dimension as well. So Selin so says, uh, since I live in Turkey, it's hard for students to even survive. That's why I was curious to know how to stay calm. Well, that's, that's I mean, you don't necessarily have to stay calm. Maybe it, it makes sense to get angry about that. But, you know, angry with the right people. Um, it's not like, you know, um, some other poor person on the street who should be the target of that. It's probably, you know, um, the regime or the, the people who are exploiting uh, other people. Jason says, can you speak to the positive parts of anger? Well, we've done that quite a lot in his. Aristotle thinks that anger is, uh, we can have, be, we can be virtuous with respect to it. We've talked about all the different ways that works. Today, any sign of anger is viewed as bad. Well, that's not true. Today, signs of anger are viewed as bad by some people in some contexts, and it's the opposite in other contexts. So we can't make sweeping statements like that, like any sign of anger is viewed as, as bad. Um, and I, I wouldn't even say we have a heavy aversion to it as a society. We're actually a very angry society, uh, at least here in America and uh, in the West in general. There are probably lots and lots of people who are indulging their anger. There are certain contexts where um, people can be very controlling about that, but those are by far not the norm everywhere right i think there's i think you know going back to aristotle we in the present are probably in situations where people tend to be more vicious in terms of excess with respect to anger and unfortunately we don't get a lot of good guidance or education or counsel or formation with respect to anger. We just say, don't be angry, right? But that doesn't help people not to be angry. We need to figure out when we get angry, uh, an Aristotelian would say, well, we need to figure out why we're having this response. What thoughts are built into this? What common psychological dynamics are at play in my head or the head of the person that I see who's getting angry, right? This is where philosophy ancient philosophy in particular, but also medieval and early modern philosophy and literature can be incredibly helpful. And that's one of the reasons I've, I've been doing these sessions, because I think that there is a lot of not just wisdom in general, but useful, practical advice, exercises, considerations that we can find if we actually go back and study these ancient authors. I know that for myself, as somebody who struggled greatly with anger, I benefited just as much from reading Aristotle and Plato and Plutarch as I did from reading the Stoics. So, um, White Tower says, could this virtuous anger be interpreted as a voluntary act on behalf of invisible auxiliaries? so as to protect the innocent citizens within a society. I mean, I guess it could, but I don't see why you need to. Um, 
I, the idea of invisible auxiliaries, I, I don't know that that makes much sense. Um, you know, the auxiliaries, they're in Plato's Republic. That's not something that we use as a category in our own not Plato's Republic all, all the time. Um, I mean, virtuous anger, virtuous anger is not a voluntary act. It involves voluntary acts, but it's, it's something that's rooted in your character. So it's not just a act. It is to have a virtue is not a single act. It is a pattern of behavior that has to do with developing habits. Uh, Selen, did Aristotle write anything about women's anger? And if he did, how is it different from men's? He didn't. Um, Aristotle doesn't say much about women. M much of the things that he does say about women are kind of stupid and, and off base. Um, later authors sometimes will, but it's rare that you're going to find somebody who's like, well, women are from Venus, men are from Mars. There's none of that kind of silly bullshit in good ancient philosophy. It's more like a continuum. And as a matter of fact, like Plato, for example, will say that women can be just as thumatic as men can be, right? That's why um, they can, in, in the Republic, they can be soldiers and police and, and stuff like that. Um, it's better to think of it like a, a continuum where, um, and, and it's less about men and women, it's more about who has power and who doesn't have power. Um, women tend to be in, in lower positions, they have power exercise them. Some men, not all men, have you know more privileged positions so they can express anger more than, than others. But Aristotle doesn't really explore that, not, not an issue for, for him. I mean, you might think, if you're thinking about ancient literature, and we're going to talk about this in a couple months, think about the character Medea, who, as you know, we're going to discuss, very powerful uh, sorceress. Um, she is sort of, you know, an expression of anger, you could say, in the uh, greatest extent, and sort of a cautionary tale, um, you know, about, about women's anger uh, and what it could be about. Zachary, my mother, my grandmother is a conservative Christian. She hates the world since she thinks are getting morally worse. Her metaphysical worldview affects her decision making, how to deal with irrational people. Uh, you, you can't really. I mean, if, if things are really that bad, you're probably not going to make much impact on her. You're not going to change her mind. Um, she's probably pretty set in her ways, and she's getting these messages reinforced by watching Fox News or going to church and hearing sermons about that or whatever, right? Um, all you can do is uh, put that aside and decide whether you want to have a good relationship with her that's not based on her being pissed off at the world, you know? I mean, you can still bake cookies or, you know, hang out or do whatever you're gonna do, right? That's that's about it, I would say, in, in a situation like that. Uh, T, would, how, would you recommend Plutarch's books about anger? Well, he's got a book that's called On Controlling Anger. That is the place to start. And if you do start there, you'll actually find that I've got videos on it that could be uh, helpful for you. He also discusses it you know, quite a bit in a number of the other things that are part of what we call the moralia. Um, anger, it's less thematic, right? But he'll talk about it in terms of like uh, the different parts of the soul. He is a Platonist, so there is a middle part that gets angry, but is also concerned with honor and, and you know, freedom and things like that. Um, and just, you know, where you see the books where he's talking about virtue, that's the places to go, I would say. Um, James Peach, can anger be good? Yes, we've already discussed that at great length here. Um, as a source of motivation, yes, we've already talked about that at great length here in, in this session. Elliot, uh, environmentalists are similar to conservatives that both think things are worse than the average person. Uh, I'd avoid making super sweeping generalizations like that. There's all different kinds of environmentalists. There's all different kinds of conservatives. Some conservatives think that things are super awesome because we live in a capitalist economy, you know, that's chugging along. I, I'd avoid that kind of overgeneralization because it's not, it's not helpful, you know? Um, and it's, you know, if, if that's the, the way you think about things, that's going to get you in lots of 
mistaken positions yourself. And with respect to anger, you know, one of the ways that we screw ourselves up is by feeding in wrong information into our our heads about these these sorts of things. Any other questions, comments? Uh, we're going on close to 90 minutes here, and I've got another event I have to do at the top of the hour, but I can take some more questions, comments. I, I will say too, while people are uh, writing them, so we've got more sessions to come. We're going to be doing another uh, excursus into uh, Greek poetry. You know, we did Homer and Hesiod. We're going to be doing Aeschylus's Oresteia, in which anger plays a major role. Those are three plays. We're going to be doing um, uh, Sophocles um, Ajax and Euripides Medea, two plays where anger plays a really major role and look at the characters. So Ajax is tick, ticked off at Odysseus and Medea is ticked off at her jerk husband, Jason, right? And uh, what do they do? How do they handle this? Um, and then we're also going to look at Epicurean positions on anger. And we're going to, by the end of the year, we're going to get to Seneca's book on anger, which I often teach in its entirety in my classes that that deal with anger so any any other questions comments we're finishing up with aristotle at this point which is not to say that we'll never come back to him but um you know we're making some slow steady progress uh through this this uh incredibly complex and rich literature out there dealing with this emotion Zachary, do you think it's possible through practice to become impervious to insults? Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't frame it as impervious. I would rather, I mean, if, if you want to get on the way to that, I would get rid of that vocabulary and, and uh, make it less, you know, perfectionist and say, is it possible through practice to learn how to deal with insults well so that you don't do stupid things and respond inappropriately? Sure. I mean, that's what Aristotle uh, talks about as, as the virtuous position. And we can think about how we actually get there, you know. And we can draw upon multiple traditions and schools and philosophers to do that. Um, Selen, oh, you're, you're very welcome. Yeah, um, we'll do more of these. Uh, usually it's third uh, Saturday of the month, but I got sick this uh, this month and had to move all my events forward uh, a ways um, in October. It'll probably be later because I think the third Saturday I am speaking at the annual Stoicon conference, the big international uh, conference, and uh, that'll be a lot of fun as well. So, all right. Well, I don't see any other questions or comments, so uh, good to talk with all of you. And I hope you'll, um, you know, show up for the, the other ones. There's lots that we can learn from these Greek tragedies, from other Greek philosophers. And I mean, think about it as like putting together a toolbox for understanding and dealing with, with anger. Um, it's nice to have a lot of tools in the toolbox rather than just one wrench and one screwdriver and one hammer. So, all right. I will see all of you. Uh, somewhere else in the ether. Have a great, you know, for you know, in Turkey, have a great evening. I know it's pretty late there. Uh, same thing with Mark in South Africa. Uh, those who are, you know, closer to here, have a great afternoon. Uh, have a great morning for some of you, and I will see you down the line.